this panel. Another set of entrepreneurs, everybody here, is an actual builder and creator, everybody on stage coming up. More actual, more actual people doing actual things and not talkers talking like myself. Um, our moderator is Kent Halliburton. He's CEO, co-founder of SAS Mining, uh, which is a hosted mining operation now in, in uh, Paraguay and in the US. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Kent is a friend and someone I've worked with for a long time. Um, Bert de Groot. Um, yeah, everybody knows Bert. Um, Bert is probably known to many of you as the tulip guy, uh, heating greenhouses with ASICs, but he actually does many things and runs a, a company that provides a, a range of services having to do with Bitcoin. He's also a great spokesperson, uh, featured widely in media uh, for, for Bitcoin itself and its potential. Um, there's Willem von Royen. Willem. Uh, Willem is a OG Bitcoiner, Bitcoin miner, engineer, uh, right curve guy, who founded a company that promises to do something you never thought Bitcoin mining could do, prepare to have your mind blown completely. I won't even spoil the surprise. Um, Lowry Pispa, entrepreneur, <laughs> managing partner at eHeat which uh, does district heating with data centers. Um, it's uh, amazing and completely uncontroversial, or should be anyway, unlike most of what we do. And finally, Yelmer Tenvold, CEO of Green Tech, does heat recovery and energy strategies. Uh, Yelmer is the kind of boy wonder of heat. Self-described. <laughs> um, this is what Bitcoin mining does uh, besides mining Bitcoin. Every, just a reminder, all the energy that goes into Bitcoin mining machines comes out the other side. Energy is conserved. It's a basic law of physics. I run into people who think that the energy coming into a miner uh, is sort of split between Bitcoin and heat. But Bitcoin isn't like a physical thing. It's not where the energy goes. There's no physics of Bitcoin itself. So all that heat exists, and it goes somewhere. Uh, and uh, all that energy has to go somewhere. And for the most part, Bitcoin miners don't use it. These folks kind of do. Yeah, thank you for that intro, Troy. Well, I think... Uh, the first question we were going to ask, Troy, you answered fairly well, which is uh, what Bitcoin mining does besides mine Bitcoin. So I think we should jump right into what your individual projects are here, fellas. Um, and I think, you know, when getting to know everybody here on Sage the last couple of days, it's pretty clear that there's some unique dynamics here in the EU that are non-existent uh, in the US and North America. And I think it's good to highlight those. So I'd love to start just by asking you, Yelmer. What are some of the unique dynamics that you experience and what sort of problems are you trying to solve with Bitcoin mining? Can you repeat the first one? What, what are some of the unique dynamics here in the uh, European Union? And uh, yeah, what are you trying to solve? Yes, well, the unique dynamics about the European market is primarily power related and subsidy related. So in order to understand why we do what we do, you kind of need to understand why it's relevant. So right now, the European Commission, the European bodies, they are heavily pushing towards a carbon-free world. Uh, there are a lot of subsidies in place to actually go to electrified heating, sustainable heating, um, and they're putting a lot of weight behind this. So what does that mean? It means that hundreds of millions, up to billions, are actually used to subsidize the uh, installation of e-boilers, of um, heat pumps and a lot of other assets to actually provide, in their opinion, sustainable heat. There's just one very big problem with this, in my opinion, and that is that it's a very ineffective economic application. So the moment 
because we have a, a company that's also selling e-boilers. <laughs> the moment that <laughs> you are actually buying an e-boiler, many of our customers, they don't actually have the intent to run that e-boiler 100% of the year. They have to intend to benefit from negative pricing. So they only run the e-boiler when there is a negative electricity price, so they can actually produce heat at an economic viable price. Well, they're predicting much more negative prices in Europe over the next coming years because of the extensive build-out of renewables, but it's still not going to be more than maybe 8 to 10% annually. So that means there's a very heavy subsidy to run an e-boiler for a very insignificant amount of time. Then if you look to the power markets, like right now, we had a very extensive energy crisis in Europe. We, well, a lot of industries went bankrupt. You know, we've been paying 800 euros per megawatt <laughs> as a base load price the last two years. It's been crazy. But the prices went back down. So a lot of industry left Europe, uh, which actually reduced the demand side. But in parallel to that, we've been building out more and more renewables subsidized, uh, causing a, a, a much larger duck curve, which basically means that the prices, whenever renewables are on, are lower and lower and lower, often also going negative, which requires load balancing. So we're creating issues for ourselves by heavily subsidizing a lot of uh, yeah, power-related things in Europe, and there's not really an answer. Well, there's one answer I think we all agree on this panel. Bitcoin mining is the most superior heating form for sustainable solutions. Because Bitcoin doesn't need a subsidy. Bitcoin is the subsidy. And this is a very powerful thing for a lot of different industrial uses that they don't realize yet. The ability to produce heat and get money for producing heat, that's not very known. On top of that, the ability to balance the grid in the fast response markets will further reduce your, your cost of power to basically zero euro. And to mine for free in Europe, you know, that's a wonderful thing. I have exactly the same problems as you, you mentioned, so <laughs> kind of hard to add anything. but. Uh, uh, we started as a mining company, and now we're more like a heat company that provides data centers to um, people in need of, of server space, mostly Bitcoin mining. And uh, of course, we're competing against other countries like in America, the power is much cheaper than in the EU, and we had the energy crisis a year ago, so we're just trying to get back to the normal after that. So in the start, we noticed that, of course, there's a huge amount of heat coming out, out of the Bitcoin mining, and we need to use it somehow. It's kind of stupid. To, it goes to waste. I, I understand that in all the places in the world, you cannot use the heat. But at the moment in Finland, it's very icy and soggy and horrible. So it's very nice to be here, by the way. Uh, so we need a lot of heating. And uh, what better the way to use the Bitcoin mining is to produce the heating. Uh, the efficiency of it is something like 99 or 98 percent, so we're not wasting any of the energy. We basically, actually, in our prep panel, Yelmer perfectly put it that the energy we use actually creates double the energy if we put it in, in like, terms that everybody can understand. So if you use one kilowatt of power for the servers, they use one kilowatt of power. But also, it creates one kilowatt of heat. So actually, we kind of produce two kilowatts of uh, energy, which is incredible. And um, the biggest problem in, in Finland, where I come from, is that Bitcoin is still seeing uh, as the energy wasting industry. So we just ne really need to uh, show the politicians and everybody that this is a good thing. That's the biggest hurdle I would say that we have at the moment. Um, okay. Um, so what FlowSolve does is. Um... Closer. 
we're here because we use heat as a product. Um, uh, what we're building is, is a new miner that allows you to apply the zeroth law of thermodynamics more directly. So, um, yeah, so we've been working on this for like three years now, and uh, our first application is distillation of water, like desalination. Um, but the applications for heat, everywhere where you need an endothermic chemical reaction, the Bitcoin comes in and it makes it more profitable. Um, so we can we boil water, and uh, yeah, it's it's pasteurization, it's uh, um, distillation, it's uh, potassium mining, lithium mining, all of these things that require heat to separate water from whatever is dissolved in the water. That's what we're applying. So yeah, we've been just building a Bitcoin miner, and that's what we're doing. And you've got a demo here. Yeah, okay, so this is our uh, RDS. This is our hashboard. Uh, it's, it's tiny, 10 by 4 centimeters. I know you Americans. <laughs> but yeah, that's, you know, it just turned out that way that it needs to be this small so you can tile it into any heat application that you want and just, uh, yeah, heat all the things, boil all the water. <laughs> Love it. So uh, Willem will uh, boil the oceans. Um, Literally boil the oceans. <laughs> Literally, that's our first application is desalination. We take the, the waste brine, the, the very salty brine that you get from reverse osmosis. We boil that. We separate that salt from, um, so instead of pumping it back in the ocean, we boil that water and we get dry salt and, and water, pure water. Yeah, so. For, uh, for me, I, uh, I started mining at home because I wanted to eat my home. So, that, yeah, super small scale. And the things are super noisy, right? So uh, I had to build a box because uh, the wife was not happy. And, um, yeah, from that point, uh, when the electricity prices exploded for my home mining uh, and my heat at home, I had to find a solution, and that was a greenhouse. And, um, yeah, that greenhouse, I built an aluminum frame around it and put it on Twitter. and. It had half a million views. So then the phone started to ring, and Bitcoin Brabant uh, had quite some things to do. Uh, so we implemented uh, quite a few installations at locations where it made sense to electrically heat, uh, instead of using natural gas, and then often in combination with excess electricity. So as uh, was mentioned before, there are heavy subsidies on a generation with renewables, and if you have excess electricity, uh, then you're not really paid for uh, delivering it back on the grid at some point. So better than just mine that away and then also use that heat. So at least you get some money out of it. And yeah, that's what we're currently doing. And first it was medium small scale businesses. And then last year we refurbished S9s. That's basically five plus year old machines. To, we, we made them silent and we sold a lot of them for the people that just wanted to do it at home with open source, home assistant, just steering them on the basis of, oh, I have a neg negative electricity price, I actually get paid, bam, the miner switches on. And then also with the heat, they put the, uh, they put the thermostat on it and it just heats the home to the temperature they want and they have excess electricity anyway, so it's super cheap in that sense. And we sold these machines for 200 euros a piece, just to make, to, to show what, what, what the capabilities are. And yeah, you see that flat mining, has, so home mining uh, is, is growing and people want to touch this and, and see what Bitcoin does. And I hope to see that grow. And it makes sense at locations where there is excess electricity in combination with heat demand where you actually replace the natural gas. So I got to say, uh, what you guys are up to is inspiring, right? And, and I think that there's some pretty specific dynamics here in the European Union that are making this innovation happen. So most people may not know, but energy, or may know, but energy is much more expensive here, right? So 
to be competitive in the European Union here, these guys are forced to innovate. But what's great about this innovation is it's eventually going to ripple out to the rest of the Bitcoin miners um, in the long term. And so what these guys are doing is not only innovating, but pioneering for all of us in our mining opportunities elsewhere. So I'm really happy to see that. And Yelmer, I know you're really excited about subsidies um, and how, they, how, how they're helping uh, with the price manipulation out there and, and creating more opportunities. And so, you know, I think we got a solution for that here with Bitcoin. But I'd really be curious to see, you know, you guys are addressing the problems of today um, through Bitcoin mining and utilizing heat in various different ways, whether that's heating districts, whether that's heating homes, whether that's desalinating uh, water, you know, giving us clean drinking water. You know, all these different approaches that you guys are taking are innovative today, but what about tomorrow? Do you guys see other opportunities that Bitcoin mining has not got to yet that we can address? Um, well, I think the unaddressed opportunities are still heat. Because right now, like, we're not Riot. We don't have a one gigawatt connection, you know. We're, we're modest miners. We're scaling up, but we're still not nearly at that volume. But what people tend to forget is if you look at energy as a mix, heat represents 80% of the total energy that's being consumed. Electricity is only 20%. So if you go to, for example, Jesse Pilk's Hash Rate Up podcast, he always answered with the question, does Bitcoin consume enough energy yet? Well, the thing is, we couldn't even consume enough electricity yet if we want to decarbonize all the heat demand with, with Bitcoin mining. There's currently not yet enough electricity to do that because we need significantly more if we want to do heating. So to... I'm, I'm making this example to actually clarify that heat will be the opportunity. And of course, there are many more opportunities besides just the heating. You know, one of the, the big ones in the Netherlands is definitely load balancing. You know, in the US, it's becoming more and more of a topic, CP, curtailment. Uh, but in the Netherlands, we do something that's called AFRR, which stands for Automatic Frequency Restoration Reserve Markets. That's a balancing market that requires a very fast response. There are not many assets that can actually participate in this market. Besides batteries, peaker plants, we don't have many of them and they often shut down in March because then they also produce heat and after March there's no heat demand anymore. And Bitcoin mining. And e-boilers, but they're not and e on. And e-boilers, but those, you know, we don't want to go there. But they, but they only can do downwards balancing. So you have two different markets. You have upwards and downwards. Downwards is consuming energy when there is an excess, and upwards is providing energy. Well, the good thing about Bitcoin mining is that it's a base load. So you can remove your load and provide energy back. And that's qualified as an upwards balancing activity. And right now, the, the grid lacks significant amount of assets to do this. So it's paying very handsomely for people to actually participate in these markets. And this is actually the largest subsidy we get on our mining activities because it just brings down our price to, 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 net, yeah, to, to a very low cost price, allowing us to, to make the Bitcoin mine one of the most competitive heating sources on the market right now. I also have to admit that if you would have talked to me one and a half year ago, you know, I would not have given the same pitch because <laughs> the energy market was just completely distorted by, by the Russian energy crisis. It's stabilizing right now, very fortunately. And therefore, right now, we're in a very unique and advantageous position that the prices are low, but the demand for balancing is high and it's growing because we're building out more and more renewables and we don't really have a solution of where that energy should go. We're just blindly focusing on you know, get more renewables on the grid because that's going to make us sustainable. And then at some point in the future, we'll figure it out. Well, we already have that future right now, but we haven't figured it out. So right now they're paying people left and right to figure it out. And that's where Bitcoin mining in Europe can be uh, doing a lot of. Yeah, Bitcoin mining is figuring that out. Exactly. Yeah, so we're doing the demand response too in Finland. Uh, the AFRR is more like a Netherlands thing at the moment. Yeah. 
Uh, it's also in Finland, but we are concentrating on the FCRD up, which means that we, when the activation comes from the grid operator, which is the Fin grid in Finland, uh, we need to shut down in two, from 2.5 seconds to 7.5 seconds, basically. And then we need to get our power back in 15 minutes. Uh, the payment back for this is quite, quite a lot. So, and there are not so many, like you told, there's not many, many who can do this. It's uh, um, hydro plants can do it, uh, e-boilers. But now the rules have changed and there's more shutdowns, so it's getting harder and harder. So that is one thing we can do in Finland. But the heating is the main thing. 44% uh, of the heating in Finland is produced by district heating. So every small city, even like a 10,000 people city, has a district heating plant. Uh, it's not connected to the next one, so everybody has their own, own every city. 44% uh, of the production is that, and it's it is something like 33 terawatts, uh, terawatt hours in a year, so something like six to 7,000 megawatts every second being used. And 88% of that is being produced by biomass burning. So that's the fancy name for a sawdust, basically, that comes from uh, paper industry. So it's a good thing since it's, it, EU has labeled it that it's a green thing because trees grow back. Mm -hmm but you're still burning, so it causes a lot of CO2 emissions. And Finland aims to be a carbon neutral country by 2035, and the district heating facilities are a big part of this. They need to find other, another solutions and other ways to produce the heat. And this is where we're coming. So the good thing in, in the electricity production in Finland is 100% based on renewables. It's nuclear, wind, solar, and hydro. So we basically are actually closing the last coal plant in next month. It's going to be on reserve, but then we only have renewables. So we don't have to try to find uh, renewable sources. It's already there. So then we just need to tackle the a little bit higher uh, electricity price compared to, for example, USA or Paraguay or Africa or so. Uh, but since we sell the heat to the district heating networks, we can get something like 1.5 to 3.5 cents out of it. And now everybody can look from the North Pool what the future is for uh, electricity. So you could buy it for something like 4, 4 to 0.3 cents. And then if you deduct this and add the demand response, we can get basically to close to zero or like 2 cents. So that's great, and you cannot even get that maybe in America. Maybe if you own the nuclear plant or so. Uh, so that's what we need to do uh, in order to compete against everybody else and uh, figure out ways to get to um, increase the use of heat to more of these places. There's also, on top of the district heating, there's uh, greenhouses and huge industrial complexes who can use the heat too. So the only problem, like I mentioned in the previous topic, is that we need to educate them and show that Bitcoin mining is good and uh, we're doing a good thing. And actually, uh, every one megawatt reduces uh, 1,500 tons of CO2 emissions if we move away from burning the biomass. So it's kind of a no-brainer for the district heating companies and others because we give them CO2 emissionless heat with cheaper price that they can produce themselves. Lori, before, before we go on to villain, I'm, I'm curious because district heating is a relatively new concept to me. I, I suspect it is for many in the audience as well. Like, what is the history of district heating? And yeah, just to find it a little bit better for us. Okay, so there's a huge power plant, uh, basically in every city. Might be bigger if it's a bigger city, but otherwise the concept is the same. Uh, they burn the, they have a reactor or like a turbine that they burn the biomass in. And in some cases it can produce also electricity. But in some cases the plants are old and it just produces heat. Uh, the price for this has actually gone up quite a lot because what's happening in Ukraine, so we, don't, we can't buy it 
anymore from Russia. And the price of the biomass has gone up significantly. Um, and then the district heating plants, they're like, um, the temperature they need to produce is something like 80 to 100 Celsius. And there there goes pipe to basically every household who wants to be in the network. And it just goes around the whole city basically. Uh, and that's how it works. Pretty simple uh, like this, but very not so simple when you go into the details. But I'm no uh, district heating guy, so I cannot explain fully. But, but a very simple concept that pipeline goes to everybody basically. Got it, got it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's another utility then, in the same way we've got water, gas, electricity, yes. sewer, like heat is a, is a utility in essence. And I think that's a, it's an interesting concept and it makes sense how you can simply plug the heat output from your mining operation into that to help offset how much uh, mass needs to be burned to wind up heating the entire, um, the entire district. So, um, there's district heating in multiple countries, and of course in all the Nordics, but also Switzerland and Canada and so on. So it doesn't stop on Finland. You can, you can do multiple different countries. Yeah, northern climates is where this uh, primarily is. Okay, thank you. Willem, how about you? What future opportunities to see that you're tackling? Is that the question? Yeah, what, what future opportunities do you see are available for Bitcoin mining uh, with your organization? I mean, okay, yes. So. Um, District heating, obviously. Um, the problem with district heating is summer. Closer. Right. Can I, a little bit closer? Sorry. So um, the issue that uh, district heaters have is, is March. You, you have to shut down, right? You, you don't have a base load of heat. So we're saying if you have extra power, um, you switch from heating water to uh, purifying it. So um, you don't, if you have all that energy available, instead of burning biomass where you have a nuclear power plant that's just generating too much energy, just uh, curtail that into, into purification because we could deal, we could do with a, a, a cleaner planet, really. The, the water that's out there is toxic. It's very bad. It's very bad. And uh, yeah, that's one of the, the problems we're trying to solve is to disrupt water using Bitcoin as a tool. Yeah, I think you, you mentioned something interesting, though, in the, in the last answer uh, that you gave about, like, opportunities with, um, I think you said lithium and other, like, kind of mining. Sub, uh, Absolutely. So yeah, I'd be any, curious any, to know more about those and how, like, I mean, does that even impact, like, so the battery the, industry, for instance? So the way we mine uh, potassium, which feeds half our planet, like, four billion people depends on potassium, depend on potassium to, uh, f as, as a fertilizer for food, for food production. Uh, so the way we mine uh, potassium, I'll get to lithium, it's the same thing, is you pump like two million liters of water into a cavern underground. That then mixes with um, the rock underneath. You pump that water out, you put it into an evaporation pond, and then you wait 18 months for the water to evaporate. And what you're left with is potassium chloride, um, which is then scraped off and sold as, as that. What we're saying is that instead of losing that two million liters for every ton of, of potassium chloride or lithium carbonate, we're saying just use the same. You're still using the water, but you're not losing, losing it to the atmosphere. So yeah, we want to close the water loop on that because that normally happens where in, in the desert, you know, like for example, there's, uh, um, was it Utah? It was a little town called Potash where the governor said, listen, there's not enough water, you need to pray for more water. And it's like, but you're, you're pulling two million liters of water per hour from, you know, from, from the Colorado River. Uh, stop doing that. Stop using evaporation ponds, just evaporate the water using energy. You know, instead of having the pond, build solar up to, to evaporate the water. So yeah, that's one of our applications as well. Same thing with lithium mining. That, that's how we get lithium out of the air. So basically over time is as Bitcoin mining harnesses more energy. And I, I use the word harness specifically because I think that it's actually incumbent on us as an industry to stop saying that we consume energy. Because I think that that's a, a false paradigm. We're harnessing energy and, and doing economic value with it, right? Um, but 
what I hear you saying is that part of the energy that we harness as we grow that energy base, uh, as the network price grows and the hash price grows, there's this economic opportunity that we can actually remove a lot of the drying ponds that are out there and all the different things that we're separating, whether that's salt, potassium, potash, uh, fertilizers that actually feed us directly could come from as a byproduct of Bitcoin mining. That's incredible. Yeah, so the, the question about the future is high temperature. So the issue that we all have is high temperature. Uh, I think that's partially already starting to be solved uh, uh, with the solutions that we see for higher temperature uh, machines that can achieve like 60, 70 degrees and then at some point even boiling. Uh, and uh, I think that's the critical thing where we where we will see also uh, Bitcoin being implemented more and more in the build environment. So we currently have a master's student, Tain, who is actually working on investigating uh, 62 degree input temperature into an elderly home. Because what we need is, we need a high temperature because we can't totally refurbish this elderly home. It's a, a bit older building, so the temperature that has to go into the system has to be quite high. And that means that the entire system would be replaced with natural gas again. And we can actually then put an installation of around 80 kilowatts in there with Bitcoin mining, which makes sense. And then most of the people would say, hey, a heat pump in this case would make sense. But when you move to higher temperatures, the efficiency of these heat pumps and the cost of these heat pumps is relatively high. So all of a sudden, the business case for actually using heating for higher temperatures with Bitcoin starts to become better and better. And this is what we first do with the university. So we, we, we have a master thesis. When that's completed, from that point onwards, we also would like to build this as a test setup and then implement this more and more. Because in this case, it's make, it makes sense. But the future in that sense is temperature getting higher and higher from the chips that are actually being used. And I think that's the need also in the industrial processes because when you move up this ladder of temperature, the efficiency decreases in general with heat pumps. And then actually we can use Bitcoin mining because there's not that much efficiency difference. And then, yeah, we will see a growth of Bitcoin mining, which is in that sense, yeah, it makes sense in every, every way when we are in these higher temperature, uh, yeah, chip heating uh, zones, let's say. Sorry, I wanted to add on that, that um, legacy data centers already produce also district heating and other types of heating, for example, in Finland and other countries. But their efficiency is something between 30 to 40 percent, and we reach almost 100 percent. So it's a huge di difference between us and them. So as I'm sitting here listening to all your guys' answers about what the opportunities are here in the future via, via mining, a couple of things are, are coming out of the, the conversation here that I'm picking up. And one is that there's some, there, there's some obstacles, some blockers that need to be overcome, right, for us to continue to proceed, to grow, to innovate um, past what you guys are already innovating and doing. And one of those is education, Laura, you've, you've mentioned that. Another I hear is an engineering problem with how do we concentrate the heat, right? How do we get to those higher temperature levels? But I, I'd love to hear you guys' perspective on what the major pain points or blockers are for you guys to progress and grow further with your businesses. Yelmer, you wanna start here? Yeah, um, I think the primary, there, there are a couple. Well, the first one is indeed the temperature range. So before What's Miner came out with their immersion models and their hydro models, the generic temperature outlet that you could achieve was 60 Celsius. And it's considered very low in the industry. Very difficult to integrate that. They call it the secondary heat source. Right, right now we get to 68, 72. There are people experimenting with 78, 80. And that's actually all considered to be a high, like into the range of high temperatures. So that, that would solve a lot of the issues of integrating your system in an industrial heat application. Um, secondly to that, I think one of the, the, the complex things is primarily commercial. So if you're, for example, if you look to a district network, the main issue they face when you're in commercial discussions with them 
is that if you preheat their power plant, they will, well, it's not only the problem, it's also the benefit of the whole solution, they use less fuel. And you might say, but, but, but that's the whole reason why you're doing this. We want to reduce CO2. Correct. However, they also produce electricity. They made a legacy investment that they want to amortize over 15 to 30 years. And the moment they start producing less electricity, it means their return on investment is decreasing. And they often split the electricity distribution entity from the heat selling entity. So there's a conflict of interest between those two parties, making it sometimes difficult to align all the interests of all parties combined. Same with greenhouses. We do a lot with greenhouses, and they have uh, gas engines that create electricity as well. So the moment that they, there's an arbitrage. The moment they, they, they give you the electricity, they could also sell that electricity. So there's a commercial value to the, uh, to the other activities. And people tend to be very focused on those outlier opportunities and say, hey, but I, I could make 200 euros. But that's only one hour in the day. They forget the 23 hours next to that where they don't make 200 euros. So for us, it's primarily finding the right combination of different commercial frameworks that ensure that everyone is aligned, everyone is happy, everyone gets what they want to get, and that we can make a project where all stakeholders are satisfied. And I think that was primarily the challenge the last two years to really find out, okay, how does that framework look? In my opinion, we defined it now, and we're executing upon that framework. Um, but, but, but that is, in most conversations, to me, a bottleneck. Same issues again. <laughs> one, one more thing uh, um, is what's good for uh, the heat company, the greenhouse, and the industrial complex we are warming, uh, is that we plug into the same connection, electricity connection, with them. So, usually in Finland, it goes so that the monthly fee is high, so more, the more consumption you have, the less you need to pay. So we coming in, providing them uh, cheaper heat, CO2 emissionless heat, and then even lowering their transmission fees because we plug into the same connection. So there's three pros for them. So at the moment, I would say the only problem is to convey the, or turn the heads of the politicians because in Finland, every uh, district heating company is owned by the city and there are politicians in the board so that is kind of the problem and we've been negotiating for years and uh, you might ask well if you get the like zero sense of energy price why why isn't everybody there well it's just not that easy to walk in and just hey we're gonna do this they're very conservative and and done things for 20 30 50 years like like they want to do, and, and this is a very new thing which you need to not only show that it's working, but it's, uh, it's proven. So that is the hardest part uh, for us. Uh, and the temperature is the second thing. It's, we need um, from 70 to 100 degrees water. So uh, we have, in some cases, we have heat pumps, but the heat pump is the most expensive um, cost in the in the whole project, so of course we would like to not have the heat pump there. Um, so we're trying to figure out different ways. Uh, for example, putting the water, the, the district heating's return water, just like preheating, like you said, that's the one option. But then, of course, they pay less. So you would want to produce the water that's primed enough so they can use it straight to the network. Limitations. Yeah, what, what problems are you facing? Uh, okay, so um, the problem with silicon, like computational silicon, um, is at 190 degrees, silicon ceases to be a semiconductor. It's just a dumb conductor. So that's the limit for silicon. I mean, there's a lot of research going on um, in using different materials, like gallium uh, nitride or uh, um, silicon carbide which have junction temperatures up to 650 degrees Celsius, which is 200 degrees above nuclear safe shutdown, right? 
um, but the lithography processes are, you know, still low. Um, so the hotter you get, the more application you have. So our limitation at the moment is is that it's it's the 185, 190 degrees where you're no longer you don't have a smart element anymore. It's not just it's just the heating element. So you can't compute with it anymore. That's, so yeah, that's that, that's our limitation, and we can lean into that. Uh, but because there's loads of applications above um, up to 190 degrees Celsius. So so we're we're faced with this challenge of not only like chip efficiency in terms of like being energy efficient, but we're also faced with like physical limitations within the chips themselves. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah and that's, that's keeping us from going higher with the temperatures and reaching more applications in the, in the heating, heating area. Fascinating. How about for you, Bert? Yeah, so a totally different issue. Um, because if you look at uh, the mining rigs uh, that we use, they are all relatively large scale. So uh, if we want to do this in location, so especially in the Netherlands, uh, there's a lot of solar there. So people have excess electricity. And in the future, they will probably put a battery in place. But you want to utilize the battery fully. So a lot of time of the year, you have uh, excess electricity. And you want to match this electricity that you actually have in excess with, uh, with the miner. And then at this moment, the miners are not really modular for smaller scale. So we don't have like efficient, a couple of hundred watt modules that we can just plug in and then steer on the basis of this flexible load that we need to do. So uh, using Home Assistant, we make it work, you know, with current, yeah, firmware integrations, but it would be nice to see more development on that side so we can actually bring the bank home to the people. So because there is a lot of excess electricity, especially in Europe, uh, local generation, which is not being fed back to the grid, where they actually shut down the generation. So let's make use of that electricity and do it with smaller scale solutions. And that's what I hope to see in scale, because that would also be cheap. Got it. I, I have something to add there. I mean, uh, when you're looking at heat applications, like, you know, like when chips get hot, it's not the heat so much that causes the damage. It's thermal stability. So when you make a chip hot and then it becomes cold and then it's that expansion and contraction of the, the physical like material that causes the damage in the chip. So as long as you keep it at a specific temperature, you can compute at 150 degrees Celsius but keep it there. Stabilize it. And uh, that's why we're doing it. It's, this, it's not a cooling system, it's a thermal management system. So. Yeah, and that's, that's the problem that we're trying to, to prove. And I think in the hydros, because the water temperature is starting to get so high uh, that the PSU is on very hard use. And that, that's the most, I think the, otherwise the machine can handle it, but the PSU is on like kind of limit. So we need to test more and, and, and figure it out. But I think we're really waiting your system to, we're really keen on it and. That's why we built it. I mean, that's the whole thing. It's just like it, the whole design around this was, how do you make it stable? How do you make it cheap? And how do you make it fast in that order? It has to be those three things. Otherwise, it's, it's not viable. So yeah, I think we've achieved it. Um, but yeah, time will tell. Okay. Definitely very modular. But I think that's the primary problem we all face. We're brute forcing an application that's not been designed to actually do what we want it to do into a mold of heating. Um, when I started doing this in 2018, 2019, we just took the end miner miners, modified them, ran them in immersion on temperatures. They were not generally very healthy yet. You know, the 17s had quite some issues at that stage. So. But we needed the heat, and we couldn't really go at lower temperatures. And you see an efficiency drop in your miner chips. So you actually mine not at 90, 29, but maybe at 30 or 31 joules per terahash. So there are downsides to heating at the current ecosystem of what's available. And there are developments right now that are going to change this. There are multiple 
organizations, companies working on miners that can handle higher temperatures, chips that don't lose their efficiency at that stage. And it's not just a chip, it's also the PSU that needs to be able to handle it and all, all the components inside. So I think we're getting there, and I think, for example, MicroBT putting their weight behind this and actually stating that this is a strategical mission of them to actually achieve this will eventually change what the market. Because if they are market makers right now, you know, they are controlling the market. So if they say this is what we're going to do, at some point we're going to do this. It might take five years, it might take 10 years, but we're going there, the miners will change, and then we don't have to modify the miners into something on a Frankenstein solution. We can take off the shelf solutions and focus primarily on building, generating, and decarbonizing the grid. Beautiful. Well, um, I mean, really what I'm, I'm hearing and gathering out of this, this conversation here today is just how substantial the engineering problems are and how there is a huge amount of opportunity for us to optimize mining around heat that we've barely scratched the surface of. And I think that's a, a fascinating topic. And, you know, we've got just about uh, four or five minutes left here. And I'd, I'd love to go around the panel quickly and have you guys wrap up by just sharing with the audience something you wish that, that was commonly understood about what you're doing. Ooh, it's a tough question. Uh, I think what would be great for us if people actually understand the why. Like in the Bitcoin industry, all the miners, or most of the miners, let me paraphrase that, they don't understand the why yet, because they go out, they find a site, three cent, they put down their miners, they don't care. They run it, they don't care. They look at their margins, they're happy, and they go home to their wives, to their bed, and they don't think about this any second. But we're actually addressing an issue here. We're addressing a problem in the EU and having a very technically viable solution. You know, there are certain companies in the mining industry that are now slowly starting to put their weight behind this, which is also allowing us to tap into deeper capital uh, pockets to actually do this at a large, much larger scale. Um, and I think the next year or the next two years, a lot will change. Um, and then the why will become much more known and understood and also perhaps a vantage point for discussions on why the others are not doing it. Yeah, we need to avoid, at least in Finland, we have, uh, we're close to Sweden and Norway, and what happened in Sweden and Norway that these miners you mentioned, multiple of them came, and since they were spare electricity, and they weren't actually way to transfer it to the, for example, the southern Sweden, but in politicians' mind, you're just using the energy and you're not using the heat, and that's why they introduced, introduced data center tax, which now makes it harder to mine and it makes it harder to everybody, even the legacy data centers. So we need to not only mine, but we really need to use the heat and, and demand response and all of this to make it, make it so that we're still a young industry and we need to show everybody that we're, we're worthy of it and, and help people also. And I think it's great what everybody's doing here. And also, this is just a small, we're all from the heat uh, world, but everything I heard before, every, there's so many different things that Bitcoin can do, and it's, it's great. Um, what was the question? <laughs> What, what would you like the audience to know that isn't common knowledge about what you're up to? Okay, so the thing is, um, as a company, FlowSolve, you know, we acknowledge that we simply don't know everything. We can't know. We have some, uh, like, very obvious applications for, for the heat, but the reason we built this like it is, is you, as, as a user of a Bitcoin miner, might have a different use case for it. So it's, our remit is to make it easier for you to apply that computational heat to your use case, whatever that may be. And we can't know that. And yeah, we want to see you know, stuff being built with this. And, uh, yeah. 
Fascinating. So you guys have built a primitive that then others are going to use to build on top of. Exactly. It's like Lego, like building blocks. So, you know, you decide how, how it's going to work for you. Yeah, I, I'm excited to see human creativity on this one as well. How about for you, Bert? Yeah, I, as I said, I want to bring the bank home. So um, I would love to see that we uh, integrate mining uh, close to home for many people. So uh, that you actually see the bank back in the local uh, areas again. Um, because the physical touch point of Bitcoin uh, is often forgotten. And um, just having every city, uh, let's say a rural area uh, or wherever there are communities, we could build solutions where actually the physical touch point of Bitcoin makes sense. So thinking of Bitcoin bathhouses, thinking of indeed district heating, thinking about excess electricity which we cannot put on the grid currently because there's, the grid is not capable of handling it. These kind of things make sense and when we scale up on that part and Bitcoin is integrated in that story, then people physically feel and see what Bitcoin is doing. And of course, on the other side, Bitcoin is solving a lot of other issues which uh, are good for the environment because it, it, it takes consumption down. But yeah, we just physically have to show this, this, this narrative of boiling the oceans that it's actually positive because we need more energy generation and Bitcoin is going to facilitate this and we can bring that back home. So that's what I hope to see. In, th in, two, in two years times, the crowd will be as busy as with the talk of Michael Saylor. All about heat. <laughs> and I wanted to add that also we need to work together, even though we are somewhat competing in the space. We're in so early stages with everything that we no, can you, still share. And you're not my competitor, you're a potential customer. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah in, in our case, but we're a little bit like in the same. <laughs> but still, we can find uh, things that we can, there's so much places we can go to and so many projects and we're yeah, so much heat to produce. So. so much. It's all about proof of work, right? So, yes. and all of us are engineers. So what, what, what in the end we like to do is we build something, we run it for quite a while and then show it. That's the way we do it. We're not marketing machines, right? We just want to show that it actually works. So that's how we are moving forward anyway. And we need to cooperate more. I, I think that's the thing that we see. So in a very tiny scale, what we saw, saw in the Netherlands was we had a small mining group, just a couple of people, and that grew rapidly to hundreds of people. And they're all doing this at home and sharing everything. And that's how we exponentially grow the knowledge also. And that's going to be implemented in the space. So it will grow exponentially. And that's what we need. The, I think the, the biggest respect you can pay an engineer is to run their hardware, specifically that. And uh, we look, really look forward to that. And, you know, yeah, future is bright and hot. Bitcoin is so hot right now. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, wrapping up here, I'd like to just point out that this is proof of human ingenuity right here on this stage. I mean, what these guys are doing is the future for all of us in Bitcoin mining, and I'm bloody proud to be here, to see it, and sit on the stage and, uh, and, and, and learn more from you guys. So thank you so much. Thank you.